Chronicles. It's, it's uh, amazing how God uses music that the first song that we sang tonight here, Revive Us Again, is the same song we sang at, first song we sang at my service tonight, or this morning, excuse me. And that's what we're going to be pre uh, preaching, what I'm going to be preaching about t tonight, revival in America. So if you have your place, if you would stand for the reading of God's Word, we'll be in Second Chronicles chapter 7 and verse 12. It says, And the Lord appeared to Solomon by night, and said unto him, I have heard thy prayer, and have chosen this place to myself for a house of sacrifice. If I shut up heaven, that there be no rain, or if I command the locusts to devour the land, or if I send pestilence among the, my people, if my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves, and pray, and seek my face, and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven, will forgive their sin, and we'll heal their land. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, I thank you, Father, for tonight. I thank you for the opportunity to be here. Thank you for the opportunity to bring this message, Lord. I pray, Father, that you would fill yourself with me, that I would step out of the way. And, Lord, I pray that you would use my mouth to say every word that you have me to say. I pray, Father, that you'd open up the hearts of the people here, that they could grow closer to you and learn something tonight so that we could go out and reach a lost and dying world for you tonight. And, Lord, I just pray for these things. And I say these things in your Son, Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. The, the, in the, where we're at here in Second Chronicles in the Scriptures, we're at the the Israelites are at the end of the uh, of the tabernacle, and they're moving to the temple now. Now, King uh, King David, which was Solomon's father, it was King David's passion to see the te uh, the temple built. But King David never got to see the temple built. But that passion carried on into Solomon's life, and Solomon had that passion. And here we are, we're at the the completion of the temple. The temple has been built, and so in order to worship as this temple and to thank God for this temple, if you'd read back earlier in chapter in chapter 7 they uh, they sacrificed 22,000 oxen and they sacrificed 120,000 sheep and the Bible says that fire came down from heaven and consumed everything and so Solomon and the people are praying to God right here to, to, to honor this temple to obey this temple and chapter uh, verse 12 Jesus, uh, God comes to Solomon by night it says we don't know if it's a dream or a vision but he comes to Solomon by night and he says I will heal the prayers that's made in this temple I will hear the the worship that is made in this temple. But, in verse 13 it says, If I shut up heaven that there be no rain, or if I command the locusts to devour the land, or if I send pestilence among my people. He's saying, if, but, if the people get out of the will of God, if you notice that my hand is no longer on the nation, if you notice that I have turned my back on thee, he's saying in verse 14 is what you got to do to get me to turn back to you. It's laid out in chronological order. It says, if my people which are called by my name shall humble themselves. We have to humble ourselves first and pray and seek his face and turn from our wicked ways to repent of our sins and then the, the promises are laid out in the verse that I will heal well let me see it says I will hear from heaven will forgive their sin and will heal their land if you in Malachi chapter 3 and verse 6 God says for I am the Lord I change not so the same promises the same things that that God tells Solomon and Israel over 2,000 years ago folks are the same things they still apply today Amen. and and so there's evidence all around us. There's evidence all around of, uh, us in our nation that America has forgotten God. Now, I don't need to explain it. You could, the, one of, the number one thing that comes to mind right now is the recent, recent allowing of sodomites to get, to get married. And, and there's, that's just one of them. There's abortions and, and, and uh, allowing uh, people flocking to churches that have rock and roll bands and, and not singing music that worship and, and honors and glorifies God. And, and people flocking to churches with women pastors and women leadership. There's evidence all around us that, that America has forgotten God. And folks... This gives us hope right here. If we're going to change America, let me tell you, people here tonight, if we're going to change America, if revival's going to happen, it's going to happen in us. It's not going to happen in the people out in the world today. It's not going to happen out in the people out in the world right now. It has to happen on an individual basis before it can happen on a national basis. Amen. 
And so he opens up his the, the text. He says, if my people, he's saying those who are qualified, God opens up by making it known who, whom he's addressing. He's saying if it's my people, God's people, people who have who've been drawn by the Holy Spirit, you've repented of your sins, and, and, and you've, you've believed on the Lord Jesus Christ for your salvation. It, 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 John chapter 10 and verse 27, Jesus said, my, pe- my sheep hear my voice and I know them and I follow, they follow me. You have to be saved in order to be one of God's people. You have to be saved in order to be one of, one of his sheep. And but you have to know Him personally. You can't just know of Him. I believe there's a lot of people in this world that know of God. There's a lot of people in this world that know of Jesus Christ. But you have to know Him personally. It says in Matthew 7 verse 21, Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. Amen. So we must be saved. And the will of the Father is to believe that the sacrifice of His Son on, on the cross that the, is, uh, is sufficient for us to get to heaven. We have, that, that's what we have to believe in. And you, you can say, well, I believe that. I believe that. But just in case, I'm going to be a good person. And so if that doesn't work out for me, my good works are going to work out for me. Let me tell you, folks, if that's what you believe, you're not saved. you got to believe solely in Jesus Christ alone. You know... And, and, and there's a lot of people, I went through this time in my life, we doubt our salvation. We, we, we doubt, and Satan gets in our mind and we doubt our salvation. But did you know your salvation is more settled than anything ever? You know, most of us, we go buy a car and we'll either, we get it paid off or when we buy it, we'll get a loan or a title for that car. And that title will say, possession of so-and-so, possession of Ben Meyer. And so you believe it's yours. You go tell everybody, that's my car. That's mine. Nobody can take it to me. But if your car is said to be seen in a crime scene, the state can come take it away from you and it's no longer yours. So how much, is it really yours? It, we, we buy a house and we pay off the deed for that or pay off the mortgage on that house and we get a, a deed that says that house is ours. says that you're the owner of it. And you, you, you live there and you sleep and you relax and you don't worry about anybody coming and taking it. You feel safe. You have all your faith and trust that that house is yours. But let me tell you, folks, it, 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 being down here in southwest Nebraska, if the state decided we're going to put an interstate across here and that double yellow line is going to go right through your house, they can make you sell your house. They're going to pay you for it, but they can make you sell your house. So is it, how much of it is really yours? Yeah. And Jesus said, My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me, and I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish, neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. My Father which gave them is greater than all, and no man is able to pluck them out of my Father's hand. Your salvation is more settled than anything else. And he goes on to say in Second Chronicles 7 and verse 14, he says, If my people which are called by my name... You can be saved, your salvation can be settled, and you can be on your way to heaven and be as quiet as a church mouse and nobody know about it. But if that's you, I don't believe this verse is talking to you, because it says, if my people which are called by my name. The word Christian means you're a follower of Christ. If you're calling yourself a Christian, you're honest with yourself, you're a follower of the Lord Jesus Christ. If I was to... Brother Dell told you I was from um, from Kansas. Y'all, some of you have never met me before, and I believe, bet you never doubted I was from Kansas. You believe where where he said I'm from is where I'm from. But folks, in America today, just telling people you're a Christian with your mouth is not enough. There's a a man in in Atwood. He moved to Atwood, Kansas, from Denver. And because his son lives in Atwood, and he moved to Atwood, Kansas, from Denver two years ago, and he was up in the he lives up in the Good Samaritan, the, the assisted living facility there in Atwood, and I had the privilege of meeting him a couple months ago, and he said he with tears in his eyes, he said the the, the saddest thing that he noticed. I don't know how it is in Southwest Nebraska, but in Northwest Kansas, this is how it is. He said the saddest thing he noticed was. That if you encounter somebody about their soul and their salvation, regardless of where they are, everybody and their dog is saved. Nobody wants to face where they're at. They cling to a name and not to a person. Let's say that every Sunday morning and every Sunday night and Wednesday night, you're having service in here. Your pastor's leading service in here, and you all gather and attend service here. But while there's a service and worship is going on in here, let's say for an example, there's a group of people that line up out there on the sidewalk and they just sit on the sidewalk in front of this church. 
They don't ever come in here, but they sit out on the sidewalk. And then when church is dismissed in here, and you all go home, those people go home too. And they'll go out into the community, those people will go out in the community and they'll say, oh yeah, I'm a member or I attend the Freedom Baptist Church. That would be an example of people that are just clinging to a name. They have no idea what, who Jesus Christ is. They have no idea what real worship is. They have no idea. They have no idea. And folks, there's a lot of people sitting in church pews today that have no idea. And if I'm called by, if he says if, if, to be called by his name, if I'm called by his name, I'm going to be unashamed to do the work of Christ. Whenever I was in middle school, I was at that age where I'm, I, I still had a few more years before I got my driver's license, but I was start, got an interest in vehicles, and I was paying attention to what everybody was driving. And I noticed that all the kids in the school, the, it seemed like all the popular kids in the school, their parents drove like nice vehicles like SUVs and, and Cadillacs and nice stuff. And my dad drove a white, our family vehicle was a white 1986 Chevrolet pickup with an aluminum camper shell on it. And it squeaked, it seemed like it made all kinds of noise over every bump you went over, the belt squealed on it. I was ashamed of that vehicle. And so what I would do was, I'd try to, when my dad would take me to school and drop me off, I'd try to get him to drop me off a block or two away. <laughs> so that I could walk into school and, and kids, they didn't worry about it. My, I mean, I didn't worry about it. But let me tell you folks, I, I'm not a very good walker and these legs aren't very good at walking. But when the walking got tough and, and, and the struggle got hard, I was sure glad to see that white Chevrolet pickup. I, feel, I believe that, that there's people in our churches today that are that way. They're ashamed of Jesus Christ. They're ashamed of the gospel. They're ashamed of their church attendance. But when the walking gets tough, they're sure glad to see him. When I'm unashamed to live for Christ, the, the fruits that I bear will show it. Matthew 7 verse 20 says, Wherefore by their fruits ye shall know them. Let's say, for instance, we're, we're in southwest Nebraska. I bet there's some Denver Bronco fans in here, maybe some Kansas City Chief fans, whatever you are. I'm not a big football fan whatsoever. But let's say, for instance, I'm a quarterback for the Denver Broncos. I'm going to do my best to get the ball to my teammates, whether it's be through passing or handing it off. Sure, I'm going to have a jersey on. That jersey's going to have a number on it that identifies me, my name. It's going to have the Denver Broncos logo on it. But the fruits of what team I'm on are going to be revealed more by who I give the ball to and on who I keep the ball out of. So Christian, we got to do more than just say I'm a Christian. We have to have fruits. There's more, it reveals more by what we do than what we say. And it's, it's easy to get complacent. It's easy to get complacent in our Christianity. I've seen it happen several times. Usually, usually the way it starts, we get complacent in our Christianity and we start to skip out on Wednesday night service. We get complacent with that and we start to skip out on Sunday night. We get complacent with that and we'll go to Sunday morning every couple of times a month till eventually we're nowhere. We don't go to church anymore. And I believe there's a lot of people like that. They've gotten complacent with it to where they've, they've gotten nowhere. And so then when things come that we need to take a stand for, like the recent sodomites or whatever, that we need to take a stand for, we can't. Because all we have to cling to is, I'm a Christian. I got no fruits to bear it, but I'm a Christian. It, it takes a lot of courage. It takes a lot of courage to go knock on a door. It, it's... I, it takes a lot of courage to knock on the door because you don't know who's going to be behind that door. Just a little humor here. One advantage that I have at knocking at the door is a lot of people look at their, out their peephole and see nobody there. And they, they open the door and they have to talk to me. <laughs> but it takes a lot of courage. It takes a lot of courage to even church member to, to work with another church member. It takes a lot of courage for you church member to go to a man that in your church that you're good friends with and you see that he's not raising his family like the Bible says. It takes a lot of courage to say, hey brother, what you're doing there is not quite right. You need to go back to the book and see. It takes a lot of courage. It takes a lot of courage to do what, what God's called us to do. In Acts chapter 16, if you'll remember, Paul and Silas were, were walking down the street and Paul cast a demon out of a girl. 
And because the, the, the masters of that girl lost their income, they arrested Paul and Silas and they began to beat them. How many of us, that'd be the first time we'd stop. Then when we started getting beat, we'd stop right there. We'd stop living for God. We'd stop proclaiming Him. We'd stop knocking on doors. We'd stop handing out tracts. But then the Bible says they went to jail. They went to prison. And at midnight, they were singing praises and hymns unto God. Just the thought of jail for a lot of us would have stopped us right there. But they're still singing praises and hymns at midnight. And then God opens the doors of the prisons for them. For them. How many of us, when that happened, we'd make a beeline out of there? Wouldn't think twice about it. That's not what they did. The jailer said, what must I do to be saved? Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. They're still standing there doing the work of Christ. And they went with the, the jailer the next morning to his house. Amen. Folks, we need a lot more Pauls and Silases in America. We need a lot more Pauls and Silases in our churches today. Amen. And so in this verse, once God establishes that this is intended for His people, he, he proceeds with what's required of His people. He says, if my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves. Humility. We have to humble ourselves. We have to say to God, God, I can't, but you can. Amen. We have to say to God, whatever you want me to do, I'll do it, because it's a losing battle if we fight against it. Everyone's always wanting the glory for what they've done. And I remember a couple of years ago, or, or maybe a year and a half ago, when I heard that this church was being built. And, and there's a lot of men that came here, I know, that helped build this church and make it what it is, the building, make the building what it is. My pastor came and did some work on the sheetrock and stuff. And it'd be, it'd be easy for those men to stand up and say, hey, look what I did. I painted that wall over there. Hey, look what I did. But no, that's not what we do, folks. We give God the glory. Amen. And if, if He wants your name known, He'll do it. But that's up to Him. We have to humble ourselves. I have the privilege to, to work with the children in my church. And, and I drive the bus, and Mr. Don, he's like a bus captain. He keeps the kids in line and everything. And so... You'll hear a lot of times when those kids get on that bus, you'll hear a lot of times those kids, so they're talking about, some of them don't come from very good homes, but you'll hear them talking about what their mom did or what their dad did or what their uncle did or, or their hero did. They'll tell what their hero did, and shortly after that, some, another one's quick to stand up and say, well, oh yeah, listen to what my hero did. And, and they humble themselves under their, their hero. But I find that when, and it's evident in my own life, and I say this because it's evident in my own life. I find that when we get older and we get jobs and we start getting income and we buy this and we buy that and we pay off our car and we pay off our house, we're quick to say, look at what I did, look at what I have, rather than giving Him the glory again. And I wasn't going wasn't gonna to bring up this illustration, but since your pastor made mention about my Dodge pickup, <laughs> I will mention it. <laughs> I was back in February. I told you I work at a Caterpillar dealership, and all the employees park. There's a, a short two foot wall, concrete or concrete wall, and all the employees park facing that concrete wall in line. And so I went and back in February. It was lunchtime. I go out to to my pickup to start my vehicle, and I get out of my pickup and I'm going back into the building, and I walk in front of the pickup right here. It's a Ford pickup. And he started that pickup in gear and, and slammed me into the walls. And I spent two days in the hospital. And I like to tell people, and I kind of believe so, the only reason I survived is because it was a Ford. <laughs> but no, that's, that would be the funny thing. I have to tell them the only reason I'm able to walk today is because of the glory of God. He's got other plans for me. And then he goes on. Well, let me first say this. If you remember in, in Mark chapter 5, Jesus comes down the mountain and he sees a maniac. And, and he, he casts the, and the, well, let me first say, he sees the maniac. And the, it tells us that the maniac well, lived in the tombs and he cut himself with stones. And, and nobody could bind him with chains. And Jesus casts the demons out of the maniac. And if you'll remember, the, the demons went inside the pigs and the pigs jumped off the cliff. Then the people came down from the, the, the mountain and they see the maniac and they clothed, clothed and in his right mind. And before the story ends, 
Pharisees. The maniac asks Jesus, says, remember me. And Jesus says, go about thy way and tell them how I have had compassion on thee. Folks, I believe that that maniac left and he went back into the town where he wasn't accepted. But he went into the town and he told him, he said, my name is now saved. It was legion, but my name is now saved. And folks, we need to go into our jobs, into our grocery store, into our churches even, and say, my name was sinner, but my name is now saved. The second thing is, after we've humbled ourselves, we can then pray. And that's what the, this verse says. If my people which are called by my name shall humble themselves and pray. It takes uh, humility. We first have to humble ourselves because it takes humility to put our face on the ground and bow and, bow and worship and pray to an almighty God and give everything to Him. But it says, if my people which are called by my name shall humble themselves and pray. Folks, we have to pray. If revival is going to happen in this nation, if revival is going to happen in America, if we're going to once again become a Christian nation, we have to get back into our prayer closet. I heard a preacher say recently, he said, maybe the reason the Sodomite was able to come out of the closet is because the Christian quit going to theirs. Amen. Amen. And one reason that our desires don't happen, the Bible tells us in, in James 4 and verse 2, says, ye have not because ye ask not. It's because we don't pray. Matthew 7 and verse 7 through 8 says, ask and it shall be given unto you, seek and ye shall find, knock and it shall be opened unto you. We have to pray. I, I mentioned when I began with, I, I work at Foley Equipment there in Colby, Kansas, the Caterpillar dealership. I, I work as a mechanic there. And there's about 14 mechanics there. And every now and then we'll get a, a, a vehicle or a machine in there and we'll troubleshoot it. And we, we can't figure out what the problem is. We've exhausted all resources amongst the 14 men there. And there, so there's a man in the company. His, his job is a technical communicator. And what you do is you, you, take all, you take all the information that you found out so far, the complaint, the tests that you've done, the results of those tests, and you document it and you give it to that technical communicator. And he takes that information and go straight to the Caterpillar engineers that designed that machine. Now, I've been there in f five years, and I've never seen uh, when, we, when it's gone that far, when it's gone to the ones who designed and created the machine, I've never seen it not be fixed. It gets fixed. I use this illustration to show folks, Christians, tonight we need to go back to the one who designed and created us because he's got all the answers. But just like at my job, we only go there when we've exhausted all resources. That's totally opposite with, with our prayer life. We need to go there when things are good, when things are mediocre, when things are tough, when, when we don't know how things are, we need to go. And then the third thing he says, to seek my face. That's devotion, worship. Worship of God. True heartfelt expression of love, adoration, admiration, and fascination. If there's somewhere else that you'd rather be tonight than in a church house, worshiping and singing and listening to preaching, you're not really worshiping God. And I'll go even a little further to say, well, you say you're here tonight and you say, I'm glad to be here. I want to be here. But at 8 o'clock, i got to be out of here because at 8 o'clock, the Broncos kick off the football game. If you've set a deadline on your time to worship the Almighty God, you're not really worshiping God. Because cause you're saying, God, you can have my time here, but at this time, this is going to take over you. We have to get back to full-time daily devotion. I say full-time daily devotion. If, you, if the only time that you worship God is on Sundays and on Wednesday nights, then on Tuesdays and Thursdays and Fridays and Saturdays, you're worshiping something else. And then the last thing the verse says, If my people which are called by my name shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways... Repentance, folks. We need to repent. We need to examine our lives and see if there's any sinful way in us. And we need to get rid of it. Don't just confess it. Get rid of it. And you, you say, well, I'm sitting here tonight and I don't know if there's any sin in me. I don't know if there's any sinful way in me. Well, let me tell you, folks, if you've humbled yourself and you've prayed and you've sought His face, that Holy Ghost conviction is going to bring whatever sin is inside of you. It's going to make it known. Before revival can come to us, before revival can come on an individual basis, we have to be clean. 
1 John 1 9 says, If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If you'll remember back in, in Exodus, when God was about to give Moses the Ten Commandments, He come down to, to, to Moses and He told Moses, he said, Go tell the people to sanctify themselves today so that they can hear from Me tomorrow. Now that's not what it says word for word. That's a summarization. So that they can, so that they can hear from Me tomorrow. They had to be clean. Folks, if we're going to hear from God, we have to be clean. And so, Psalm 66 and verse 18 says, If I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. So if there's known sin in your life, if there's known sin that you're dealing with, and you pray, He's not going to hear you. You're unclean. You have to be clean. And so then God has laid out what is required of His people. And once Christians meet those requirements, there's a great promise made at the end of the verse. It says, says, if my people which are called by my name shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven. He's going to hear our prayers. He's going to hear every word that we say. There will be no more hindrance or interruption to our, our, our communication with the holy and righteous God. It's kind of, it'd be like, I, I picture it like a, a mother trying to get to her screaming child and there's no muffling of the crying or anything. She can hear it loud and clear. That's how it's going to be. There's going to be no more sin that muffles our prayers getting to God. He's going to hear us loud and clear. And then he says... I'm going to forgive to be, they'll be, you'll be forgiven. First, again, go back to 1 John 1 9. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If you remember the story of the prodigal son, the prodigal son, he, he went to his father and told his father he wanted half his, his half of the, the inheritance. And he goes out into the world and he wastes his inheritance on riotous living, the Bible says. And he gets to the point where he has no money. So he goes to a farmer that has pigs in a field, and he gets a job feeding those pigs in this field. And he's still so poor and hungry that he, all he wants to do is eat the same slop that he's feeding the pigs. And he comes back to his, he gets it in his mind, he says, if I go back to my father, he'll hire me as one of his servants, and his servants have more food to eat and more blessings than I do here. And so he goes back to his father and he repents of his sin. And his father takes him in and his father forgives him, and they throw a party just like it never happened. That's what God is. When we go to him, when we repent of our sins, it's, they're gone. It's just like it never happened. And it says, I will heal their land. I'll be 30 years old in November. And I, there's, like Brother Don is an example, there's people in my church that lived in, in, in decades that I didn't live in or I was too young to remember. Yet. Remember, they, they, they speak about how America used to be in those times and how it's not now. And I only dream of how it was then. And I'm sure there's people for you, you remember your mom and dad talking about what our country was like when they were younger and how it, it's gotten to where it is. Or maybe your grandparents. Folks, if God heals our land, it's going to be greater than that. And just like the prodigal son, when he went back to his father, when he turned from his ways and went back to his father, their relationship was healed. Their relationship was healed. And that's what a healed land is going to be. Our relationship with God is going to be healed. So I'll end here tonight. And I'll ask you, first of all, how's your salvation? Is it settled? The second thing is, are you proud of it? How's your humility? Are you humble? Do you need to work on that? How's your prayer life? Have you been out of your prayer closet for a while? Do you need to start a prayer life? And then, is there any sin in you that you need to get rid of? Folks, my, my church, we, we, pray, we come down to the altar every service, and we pray for revival to happen in America. But revival has to happen on an individual basis in the hearts of every person here before it can happen on an a, a, a area-wide basis, before it can happen on a statewide basis, before it can happen on a national basis. Revival has to ha happen on an individual basis. So I ask, where are you tonight? So let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, 
Lord, I thank you, Father, for tonight. Father, I pray that this, if there's anything that's been brought to attention to somebody's attention here tonight, that they get it settled, that they get it straightened so that they can go on and serve in you and be a, a better servant for you, Lord. And Father, I thank you for tonight for being here to be able to bring this message. Lord, I ask that you'd work in everybody's heart here. Pray, Father, that you do a work in every heart here. And I say these things in your son Jesus' name. Pastor.